In the pages of the Bible, men were known by mantles they wore. You could tell a lot about a man by his mantle, the color, pattern, fabric, and shape of their garment, denoted their tribe, family, occupation, and standing within the community. In ancient times, your mantle was a symbol of your past, your present, and your future, all woven into one distinctive garment. Patriarchs, priests, prophets, and kings all wore unique mantles that set them apart. In those days, a mantle outwardly confirmed an inward calling and commitment. Your mantle was your legacy. When Elijah the prophet's time on earth had ended, he was taken up by God. His mantle fell back to earth as his successor Elisha looked on. The man left, but the mantle stayed. Though the patriarchs, priests, prophets, and kings all passed, their mantles were waiting to be passed on, picked up, and worn with anointing and authority. Every mantle ever made by God is still here on earth, waiting for us to pick up, to put on, and to take our place as patriarchs, priests, prophets, and kings. Mantles are waiting. Amen. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Even though it's a holiday weekend, we still serve God. That never changes. Amen. And uh, so we pray for all of our friends who are on the lake right now. <laughs> Streaming. <laughs> there. We love you and uh, we love you. No, we're, I'm grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I believe God has a word for us today. Today is not going to be traditional in the sense of, uh, you know, grabbing a scripture and sort of unpacking it and uh, taking it into the relevancy of our lives. It's going to be a little different. Can I take you to Bible school today? We're going we're gonna to do something in this series in particular that I think is really important. A lot of times we... We only have so much time on a Sunday morning, so we'll really dive in to and drill kind of deep on one scripture or a few verses. But this series, Mantles, is really going to take us into the overarching themes of the Old Testament and how God ministered to his people um, the anointing and the authority to establish his will on the earth. And I remember years ago there was a... Uh, um, funeral service, memorial service that we had for someone that was in our ministry, a very um, exemplary leader and a powerful worshiper with a prophetic anointing. And I remember my, my father, my pastor, um, teaching at that service about mantles, how even when the man passes on, the mantle passes down. And I remember my dad giving that vision that they just showed us on the screen of a mantle sort of floating down to earth, just like Elijah the prophet when Elisha took up the mantle. And I remembered seeing that and hearing that um, by the Spirit when he spoke that and really getting it, that mantles are not for the hereafter, they're for the here and now. You don't need authority and anointing in, in heaven. That's for your assignment here. And whatever mantles, whatever authorities, whatever anointings have ever been opened up on this planet and, and dispensated to God's people are still among us. They're still here waiting for us to pick them up. Powerful mantles. And, and if you don't understand really what a mantle is, in, they gave us a little bit of a, a, a prequel to, to this idea with the video, but they, they were not anything like what we wear today. We don't wear the same garment every day. And in winter, we could probably relate a little better because we choose a coat that we may wear every day, an overcoat over our clothing, and we don't worry about repeating that garment, right? Well, in the Old Testament, men would wear the same garment uh, every day, and you could see them from behind uh, a long way off and know exactly who that was based on the weave, the color, the pattern of their mantle. 
it was significant to them. You know, years ago, the first time I ever went to London, I um, went on a trip with my parents. We called it the 2550 tour because my parents were having their 25th anniversary. My grandparents were having their 50th. And it was Stacy and I's first time to go to Europe. And we were in this beautiful little boutique. Uh, I'm sure my mom will remember the details better than me, but we were looking at um, plaids. They're called tartans in Europe. And so she and I were touching, we're, we're going, ooh, this one's beautiful. It's got green and red and blue. And, and all of a sudden, this lady, and I'm using the word lady very generously, yelled across the room to my mother and said, stop touching that. And I was about to go, I'm about to snatch your hair right off the top of your head. Nobody talks to mama like that. <laughs> so she yells at my, my, we were like, well, excuse us, you know. Uh, she was helping someone else, and she did not want us touching any of the tartans there. Well, years later, we went back to Scotland, where tartans are from, and we found out they were, you know, illegal for years because they, each clan had its own plaid. That tartan pattern would be identified, and it could stir up riots. They would begin to fight one another based on uh, land issues and recognizing so the, a last name. So our guide in Scotland, um, he, he said, you know, I can look at anything. We picked a plaid because we like the color. And he would say, no, I can tell you that's a McDougal. And he, would he could name every last name that went with the plaid. It was a language for them right so that comes from ancient times in ancient times in in biblical days they would have a weave they would have a color they would have a pattern or style that was intrinsic to that particular clan or family and they were um, important because it designated them who they were in the family was marked on that uh, what they inherited um, and, and a lot about who they were their identity was woven into that garment. So it wasn't just like something we might buy off the rack at Zara and wear it a uh, blazer. It was passed down. It was important. It was added to. So mantles represented authority uh, and anointing. Authority permits you to do something. It's like wearing a ticket in wherever you need to go. And anointing preserves you for a purpose. So a mantle represented those two things significantly. When Elijah passed down the mantle or dropped the mantle, he's taken up into heaven that mantle of prophet, every victory, every, every obstacle, everything he'd overcome was then passed down as a legacy to the following prophet. So he's going, so Elijah, you don't need to overcome what I've overcome. I'm going to give that to you. So it's now emblazoned. Every victory I have, you can wear. Everything I've fought, every enemy I've overcome, you can wear this emblazoned sign of victory. And this is what's beautiful, is it ended up turning into the Old Testament into something they would use on their shield. So if I beat you in battle, and your shield had the emblazoned marks of every enemy you'd taken down, then I add that emblazoned mark to my shield. Not, did, not only did I take you out, but I also then could take credit for every enemy you've ever taken down. This is the symbolism of a mantle, okay? It's important for us to understand this because it's, it's a symbol today for a spiritual pedigree that God is saying, this is your inheritance. You've been walking around wearing shame as a mantle, wearing insecurity, wearing insignificance, wearing slavery, all the marks on you are showing, and I want to trade that garment with you. If you'll give that to me, I'm going to give you your rightful inheritance because you've been grafted in through the finished work of Jesus Christ. This is your pedigree. You shouldn't be walking around with your head hung down. You need to know who went before you. You need to know what battles have been won, and you need to wear it with power and authority. Amen? Step into it. Into agreement with it. 
When I was choosing what I was going to wear today, I had a couple different jackets. I have a new jean jacket that I wanted to wear, and, and I usually plan out, like, how, what do I feel like? You know, it, girls, we can, we can plan it out. I used to do that, and then I'd be like, I don't feel like that today. I don't really want to wear that today. It doesn't matter that I've got it all together. Well, I realized the only difference between what I end up wearing and what I, I could wear in my closet is what I come into agreement with. Right? What do I choose? It's not what's permitted for me to wear, but what do I choose? And I even chose what I'm wearing today because when I wore this dress before, something significant happened to me that I associated with something very negative. And I, I'm like, I'm never going to wear that dress again. I'm going to burn it. <laughs> That's how strong my feelings were. And the Lord took me to this dress in my closet. I was going to wear something different. He said, Amy, you're talking about mantles. And you've been praying and asking me why I've been grieved against you. And I have. I've been asking the Lord, saying, I, I know that your favor's always been on my life, but I feel that there's a distance and I've done something to dishonor you because I know that you are present, you are near when, I, when you're honored, when you're worshiped. But I, I feel there's a di I've done something. What is it? Why are you a little bit further away? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Amy, it's because you've been taking on and you've come into agreement with the mantle of victim. And that's not who you are. And the Lord took me back to this dress and said, you are an overcomer. And you're going to wear it because you're still standing. No matter what was spoken against you, what was done against you. See, mantles are important for us to understand because our association with who we are when we step into something. I get dressed based on where I'm going. I could show you 10 different jackets right now. I could show you a, a Lululemon one that my brother bought. I wouldn't wear that here because that's for working out. In fact, I never wear it at all. It's beautiful. But, but, but I don't wear the same things based on where I'm going. I change that based on the plans for what I'm going to step into. And today God is challenging you and saying it's time for you to change clothes because where I'm taking you looks different than where you've been. It's time to take off the old and to put on the new. And the new for you is a patriarchal anointing, an anointing to establish the will of God. That came to the patriarchs. Let's look at who they are. The patriarchs are Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. I'm taking you to Bible school. You're going to get a credit for this class when you're done with it. We don't start with Adam because Adam uh, failed. And because Adam failed, God had to just start over. So Noah is the lineage that we began with. There's no reason to go back to Adam because through Seth, he's represented in Adam, in Noah. But Noah was God's plan B. So Noah is the patriarch we call the first patriarch, then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. Does it mean there was no other significant men in this process? No, that's not what it means. But these patriarchs, there was a passage of authority and anointing, a preservation and permission that came through the bloodline that is your rightful inheritance. We're going to talk about what they were. So these were the men, and the main point of this message is really that they all had the same goal but a different assignment. And this is interesting and it's important for us to understand because every generation, the goal is the same. Establish the will of God. But the assignment can look very different. One generation to the next, we don't go about fulfilling it all the same way. And I think this really teaches us something about the way God works. The goal was, the common goal, generation to generation, was to take possession of the promise given by God. This goal re required something different from each patriarch. And every generation has a different assignment, but the end result is still to establish the will of God in our lives, in our families, and in the earth. Now, this is, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. There are five distinct authoritative anointings represented in the patriarchal mantle. We're going to go through mantles in the next couple weeks today. Next week, it's kings and priests. Today is patriarchs. And it's important that we start at the beginning because patriarchs are anointed to establish. Repeat that with me. Anointed to establish. 
Did you know that you need an anointing to begin? That's the first distinctive authoritative anointing is the anointing to begin, number one. Number two, I will repeat these, so it won't be the only time I say them. The second distinctive authoritative anointing in the patriarchal mantle is the anointing to receive. Three, the anointing to increase. Four, the anointing to overcome. And five, the anointing to remember. I know that sounds funny. You don't think you need to be anointed to remember until you hit about 45. And then you need an anointing to remember where your keys are. That's not what I'm talking about. But we do need an anointing to remember. And, and I'll go through that in a minute. So let's look at what made each patriarch unique. Noah is, has a unique situation because he had to lead through unspeakable destruction and begin again. When I've always looked at the story of Noah, I always think, man, how amazing to just have a clean slate and to just start over. But it wasn't a clean slate. In fact, you know, we, we sort of edit stories the way that we picture them, the way that we want to see them. And I realized how profoundly this had happened in my life when I remembered back to the fact that we had twins uh, born 20 years ago. But we decided to do their nursery in Noah's Ark and because they came two by two. Right, So we did little murals on the wall, two by two. I had little cute little bookends. And, and then we saw a Christian comedian a couple years later, and he laughed about the fact that so many nurseries are, you know, Noah's Ark and the flood. And he said, it's just funny on the mural that we don't include like a little rock down there with people screaming for their lives as water is rising, you know, and dead bodies floating everywhere and people that can't swim. He's like, why do we make this such a sweet baby story when it was anything but? But we edit it, you know, how we want to edit it. So we see the sweet little animals two by two and living on a zoo for 40 days and uh, 40 nights, how that would feel. But the truth is, Noah didn't just get to start with a clean slate. In fact, the ground was so saturated, nothing would grow. All of the foliage is rotting. You think, underwater for months. Bodies everywhere. It was more like trying to lead through the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. But by yourself, with no help. You need to picture what it was really like for him as a patriarch, he needed the anointing to begin, to start over. Why do we need the anointing to begin? Because you and I, we have the same thing. Oh, I'll start this when I get enough funding and enough money and enough people behind me. Oh, I'll begin that business. I'll obey God. I'll step out when I have all this situated first. When I have all the time in the world, we make all of these excuses for why we're not beginning because we want a clean slate first. And God is saying, but wait, I have given you an anointing to lead through circumstances that are not ideal. I've had to do it over and over in my life to step into a situation where someone else made a mess. And I'm saying, God, can't you just give me a brand new field where I can just start from the beginning? No, Amy, because I've given you an anointing to begin again. You have an anointing to start over. Why? Because God knows we need to know how to begin again and again and again and again. And we need that unction and anointing to push us past whatever devastating circumstances. I know there have to be people under the sound of my voice who've been through divorce. And you think, how will I ever start over? Because Noah is not much different than you. You can, you can have a clean slate and, and, and a new apartment and a fresh space where old faces are out of your life. And you don't have to say people's names that you used to have to say. But you have a memory. So did Noah. However he had to start over, there were hundreds if not thousands of people's names he remembered that were no longer a part of his life. And yet he had to lead through unspeakable situations and begin again. God will give you an anointing to start where you're not stuck on start the rest of your life. But you can begin something new again. You don't have to have it all perfect. You don't have to have it all straight. He'll anoint you. What you have in your hand 
to accomplish the assignment. So Noah's anointing was to begin again and again and again. Okay, let's look at Abraham's situation. In the time between Noah and Abraham, idolatry returned to the earth. So God's back in the same situation, and he's going, all right, we're going to have to do this differently. So what I'm going to do is call a man, a pure man, out of his father's household so he's not overshadowed by idolatry, where my voice is the only one that he hears. I'm going to call him out of that place of safety. But for Abraham, this is difficult because walking away from an established inheritance was not something a man would do. So he went against everything in his culture to walk away from his father's household because he heard a voice. God called him away from that place to establish something new. And the anointing on Abraham's life is the anointing to receive. You and I need to understand this. We can't we cannot step into the authority of the anointing to receive if we cannot walk away from the old thing. We cannot get the new thing. We have to obey God. It's difficult to open our hand to let go of the old thing. You know, for, I'm 45, so I was two and a half years old when we came to North Dallas from Houston. My parents drove here, and uh, they say there was nothing but a fish tank and me in the back seat. Uh, they walked away from a lot. They walked away from established relationships, from an established denomination. Uh, they found uh, a deep relationship with God, gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, a passion, a purity, an intensity in that denomination. But there were, there were limitations to the voices in that denomination that God called them away from. There was a belief system there that if, if a, a female came into the room wearing pants, she needed to go right back out because she needed to get good before she could get God or the gospel. And I remember my dad explaining that to me later on. I never cut my hair until I was 11 years old, except a piece of gum that my mother cut out of it when I was little, and it's still in my baby book. But we, the belief system that came from that denomination was you know, females, you don't wear pants, you don't wear makeup, you don't cut your hair. And I remember my dad saying, that's not why we left. That's not really important. Why we left was because we believe the gospel is for whosoever will. We believe everyone has the right to be discipled. That they don't need to change before they even hear the opportunity what they can step into. And so Covenant Church was, was founded as Carrollton uh, Pentecostal Church in the downtown uh, bank building of Carrollton. You can go eat at Babe's Chicken Dinner, and then you can go tour there and see it. If you'd like, I believe a dress store is in there now. But that's the space where they came to start. They had to walk away. They had to sacrifice the voices of a lot of other opinions. And I, I know that cost them greatly. It cost them in our family relationships that they had to walk away from. You know, because if you left that denomination, you weren't going to heaven anymore. So there, there was a big line in the sand. And, and very much like Abraham, Pastor Mike stepped out of the known into the unknown to follow a voice just to obey. All of us are anointed to receive the blessing of Abraham. The blessing includes elevation, dominion, and possession. But we can't receive that mantle and that mandate until we step away from the old voices. And there's a reason for that. God does not want to bless you with possession, elevation, and dominion if you are still connected to the parasite relationships who will not allow the right things to flourish when he does bless you. He needs to remove you from those situations but it's got to be your choice where you walk away. And sometimes we wonder, why isn't God blessing me? I know all of this is available. Well, it's because he doesn't want to feed the wrong things. So when you step away from the wrong voices, from the wrong things, you can follow just like Abraham. You step into the mantle, the anointing that preserves you and that permits you to receive the blessing and establish the blessing of God. So that was Abraham's assignment. Isaac's situation and assignment was different. Isaac was the promised seed of Abraham and Sarah. I know I'm not talking about matriarchs much this morning, but they were very important. And I want to point out right here why and how we see how important God 
believed women were in the work of establishing what he was doing. And this is how I know. Because the blessing of Abraham that God promised that your, your, gen, your generations after you will be like the sand and stars, he was not willing to honor that promise through any other woman except Sarah. So the promise was not for Abraham. It was for Sarah. He had several other children with other women. And God said, no, that's not where the covenant resides. It's between you two. I will bless her seed, not just yours. I'm not willing to work outside of this woman that I've been talking to. She made the same sacrifice as you did. She made the same steps you did. I'm not using some other handmaid. We're not buying or renting a womb to produce what I'm calling out of you. God didn't work around women. He worked through them. So matriarchs are just as important. But in this situation, Isaac is produced from this covenant relationship of Abraham and Sarah. And he was the recipient of an unguarded inheritance. Now, what I mean by that is there were no boundaries. There were no fences. This was just his father's wanderings where God said, everywhere you put your foot, I'm going to give it to you. But it was unguarded. It was unestablished to that point. All right? It was a walk by faith. Abraham had won battles. He had spoils. He was looked at upon as a king in that region. But when he passed away and his son stepped into it, Abraham had dug these wells all over the desert region so that he he could shepherd his sheep and they could have water and they could flourish in spite of the weather. But when his son steps into that inheritance, it's unguarded. The Bible says that God blessed Isaac and he increased until he kept increasing until he increased very much. There were three levels of increase on the life of Isaac. But Isaac's assignment looked different than Abraham because Abraham's assignment was to move while Isaac's assignment was to stay. Same goal, establish the will of God on the earth, establish the work of God on the earth, but it looked different generation to generation. And Isaac's assignment was to increase in spite of his enemies. What did that mean? That meant for him that he had to Commit to the daily defense of redigging wells. Things his father had done years before, enemies would come and pour dirt in the top of the wells so that they could try to diminish the blessing of increase on Isaac's life. Isaac's assignment was revisit those wells, dig them back up deep or deeper than they were before. And I'm sure Isaac felt like his, his role was just maintenance. But it was important because these were the days God was increasing the wealth of Isaac. You know, sometimes for you and I, we make enemies our excuse to not increase. But can I just remind you that you don't have any haters when you don't have anything. When you have something worth taking, you have enemies. You have annoying things that keep stopping up the flow in your life. Why? Because there is something you have that someone else wants. And I'm not talking about flesh and blood. I'm talking about an enemy who wants the territory back from you. So a lot of times we can think this is mundane, unstopping wells, going worshiping regularly, praying regularly, walking out the territory that someone else set for me. But God is calling us to increase in spite of our enemies. That's an anointing of the patriarch, Isaac, the anointing to increase. You know, when my mom and dad first came and started Covenant Church, um, my dad went into the bank to get a loan. And, and when he did, and I don't remember what it was called. It was in Carrollton. I remember where it was. But when he walked in there, the, the banker was angry and agitated with him. And he got to the root of why. And the man said, you know, you're just another pastor. The last one who came through here. He had a car loan with me. He had a building loan with me. And he, 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 he got derelict in the loan. And then he just abandoned, walked away, and left me with debt. And my dad said, all right, God sent me here to establish a church. How much debt? 
And he told him. And my dad said, then that debt is mine. Because God called me here to establish something. If that means redigging the wells, that's what I'm committed to doing. So Covenant Church, we started in debt, not because we created it, but because it was a wound left by someone else. And when, once you recognize, you know what, I am called to establish something, and God didn't give me a list of acceptable excuses why I don't have to do it. It doesn't matter that somebody else left me with a bill. It doesn't matter that I was given a legacy that wasn't any good in my eyes. It only matters that God says, I have given you the pedigree and anointing and calling to establish a work. I want to say to you this morning, you may not feel like you've gotten a very good legacy right now, a spiritual legacy, but you are somebody's Isaac. You are somebody's Abraham. You are somebody's Moses. You are somebody's Jacob. Your descendants that come after you, those that you influence after you, you are turning the tide right now. Hear me. The decisions that you make change everything because you're connecting the future with the God of the past, the one of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's situation was different because he was born with determination and desire, but he was disqualified by his birth order. He wasn't the first son, so he struggled from the time he was born. But his assignment was to reestablish relationship with God for his future descendants. You know, Jacob has the anointing to overcome because the word that God spoke over him is you've wrestled with God and man, but you have overcome. And as a parent, I know this to be true, is that there's times where my kids have struggled and I, I've so wanted to step in and rescue them from the fight. But there is nothing that establishes you quite like struggle. There is nothing that connects you to God like struggle. There is nothing that helps you identify who you really are to hear the voice of God for yourself like struggle. And when you've been rescued from struggle over and over again, you can find yourself in a place where you have no idea who you are. God is the God of the struggle. And when God comes to the next patriarch and after 400 years of slavery in Egypt, Moses comes out, he's drawn out into the wilderness 40 years he's out there, and God speaks to him through a burning bush, and he introduces himself to Moses as, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, but I'm the God of the struggle. And you really need to know this right now, Moses, because you may not know me, but you know your forefathers, and you know what they've been through. You know what I did for Abraham. You know that I called him out of a foreign land, that I promised him everything that his feet would touch. You know what I did for Isaac. You know I increased him. You know I increased him at, at, at the rate of his enemies increase. But you know that I blessed him until he was overflowing with blessing. And you know that Jacob struggled for his identity, but he wrestled with me and I connected to him and I renamed him. And now you carry his name as Israel. That's the God I am. And Moses' situation was different than any of his predecessors because Moses, his recent history was slavery. All he knew. The people he was called to lead, their history was only slavery. It's all they knew. This is why part of the patriarchal anointing to establish something is the anointing to remember who you are. Why? Because you can be overshadowed right now. Your identity can be overshadowed by your recent struggle. And God is saying there is an anointing, though, that will preserve your identity if you will remember who you are. I know right now you feel like a slave. You look like a slave. You smell like a slave. But that's not who you are. 
And there's an anointing. If you're going to establish yourself in the promised land, Moses, all these people now, it's time to take possession. But they've forgotten who they are and how far I've brought them. They forgot how I used their enemy to multiply them. And right now, if they don't remember who they are, they're going to miss the window of stepping into the new thing. So right now, above all else, they need to be reminded of who they really are. There's an anointing to remember. Stand with me if you would. I'm going to take you back to the beginning of this message when I told you about this dress that I hate and the situation that I walk through. And I asked the Lord, I said, I feel, I feel you're grieved. And this is the kind of relationship I have with the Lord. Please don't leave here and take this as something as, oh, Pastor Amy's not hearing from God. He's turned his face from her. And that's not what I mean. When you, you know, if you're married and you have a close relationship and you ask your wife, how's she doing? And she says, fine. She's not fine. Run. <laughs> She's not fine. Well, when you're close to someone, the nuance of communication shifts a little. You feel it. And that's how it was between God and I. And I said, I feel it. I, I don't know what I've done, but I, I feel that you're grieved with me. I need to know why. And the Lord said, because you've come into agreement with your recent history. That's not who you are, Amy. The physical struggles you've been through, you're not a victim, Amy. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Amy. I am the God of the overcomer. I want you to put that dress back on and I want you to make some declarations because that mantle of shame, that mantle of insecurity, that mantle of infirmity is broken in the name of Jesus. Anything you come into agreement with that is less than the anointing to establish the kingdom of God on the earth, I want you to throw it off of you and receive the anointing, the five-fold anointing of a patriarch. That's the anointing to begin, to start over when you're stuck on start. It's the anointing to obey and to receive the new. It's the anointing to increase in spite of all the adversity against you. It's the anointing to overcome through the struggle to reestablish a deeper identity in Christ. And it's the anointing to remember who you really are. You are not a victim of your recent history. God wants to roll the reproach of Egypt off of you today. Did you know the children of Israel who were born in the wilderness were not even born in Egypt? God said, you still have Egypt on you. How's that happen? Because we have to allow the circumcision of our heart generation to generation. You can pass down the beautiful things and the memories and the, the miracles and the memories of the miracles to your children, but you can't pass down relationship with God. You can't inherit relationship with God. You have to surrender. You gotta let go. You gotta say, God, roll Egypt off of me remove those reactions that look more like a slave, sound more like a slave than a landowner. Why? Because God believed that they were capable of being slaves and landowners, inheritors in the same lifetime. The only limitation was theirs. And this morning, I believe God is calling us to establish the kingdom here in this community in McKinney, Texas. And this is not an easy job. I don't know why the soil seems like it's so resistant. It's hard, it's not easy. I've done easy and I've done hard and, and this isn't easy. What you're fighting here, living here isn't easy. What we're building isn't easy. 
but the foundation's going to be right. And we are gonna establish something that outlives all of us. We're gonna establish something that increases our own Isaacs, amen? We are establishing and declaring something and we are walking by faith right now. We're taking steps by faith away from the old and into the new. You wanna receive this mantle, lift your hands. That's how we receive anything, we put our hands out. Father, I thank you right now for the anointing to begin again. I thank you for leadership, that it rises up in your people right now, that we can lead even through devastating situations. God, I thank you right now that you are giving us a vision. We walk by faith, not by sight, and we take steps according to your obedient word. We walk right now by faith in Jesus' name, away from the old. We're gonna stop rehearsing our recent history. We're not victims, we are overcomers. We receive increase, new birth in Jesus' name. We celebrate it, we receive it, we thank you for it, and we will.